My brother beat me for years and tried to steal my house. So when he came begging for help, I let him face the consequences alone. I've left town to start over, but I feel like my past is still haunting me. How do I even begin to heal? I guess I should start by saying that I don't really know what I'm hoping to get out of writing this. Maybe I just need to put it all into words to make sense of it. Maybe I'm hoping someone can tell me that I'm not crazy for feeling like I've been living in some twisted reality for the past 22 years. Either way, I've been carrying this around for too long and it's time I let it out. So, a little backstory. I grew up in a small town where everyone knew each other's business and my family was no exception. There was me, my older brother Noah, and my parents who, to this day, I'm convinced have selective vision when it comes to their precious firstborn. Noah was the golden child, plain and simple. If he got a bad grade, it was the teacher's fault. If he stayed out late, my parents would shrug and say, boys will be boys, and if he did something that was so clearly wrong like smashing a vase or throwing a tantrum at the age of 16, they'd somehow find a way to blame me. Why did you make Noah so upset? They'd say, as if I was responsible for his inability to control his temper. And his temper, God, that was the worst part. Noah had this, I don't even know how to describe it, it was like living with a ticking time bomb. One second everything would be fine and then boom he'd just snap. And when Noah got angry he didn't just shout or slam doors like normal people. He hit. He hit hard. And for some reason I was always the target. I'm five years younger than Noah so you can imagine what that looked like growing up. It started when I was little, maybe six or seven. He'd shove me around, knock things out of my hands, stuff like that. At first it seemed like normal sibling roughhousing, you know? But it escalated quickly. By the time I was in middle school he was full on beating me up like using his fists, his feet, whatever he could get his hands on. There was this one time when I was about 13 and Noah was in high school. He was mad at me for something stupid. I think I borrowed one of his video games without asking. Anyway he came into my room, closed the door and just started wailing on me. It felt like forever before he stopped, and when he finally did I could barely see out of one eye because my face was so swollen. I went to my parents thinking this would finally be the thing that made them realize how out of control he was. But when I told them what happened they looked at each other and then at me and my mom said, what did you do to provoke him? Like it was somehow my fault that I'd just gotten the crap kicked out of me in my own bedroom. That's how it always was. Noah was their star, their golden boy, the one who could do no wrong. And me? I was just the afterthought, the extra kid they had to deal with. I wasn't allowed to get angry. I wasn't allowed to have emotions. If I ever pushed back, my parents would tell me I was overreacting, that I was being too sensitive. It was always me who had to be the bigger person, never Noah. This went on all through high school. I got really good at hiding bruises. I stopped inviting friends over because I didn't want them to see what was happening. On the outside, I tried to keep it together. Straight A's, extracurriculars, the whole perfect student act because I thought maybe, just maybe, if I was perfect enough my parents would finally notice me. But no matter what I did, Noah always came first. I'll never forget the day of my high school graduation. It was supposed to be this huge deal, right? Like I'd worked so hard for this moment, I was even valedictorian. But of course Noah had to ruin it. He was in college by then and he decided to come home for the ceremony. I should have known something was up because he'd barely acknowledged me since he left for school, but I thought maybe, just maybe, he was coming back to support me for once. Boy was I wrong. That night, after the ceremony, we had a small gathering at our house. It was mostly family, a few close friends, nothing crazy. I was feeling good, like maybe things were finally looking up. But then Noah pulled me aside. He had this smug look on his face, and I knew right away that whatever he was about to say wasn't going to be good. Congrats on the speech, he said, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Too bad it's all downhill from here. Before I could respond, he grabbed my arm hard enough to leave a mark and whispered, you'll never be as good as me. Don't even bother trying. I wanted to scream. I wanted to tell him to go to hell. But I didn't. Because even though I was 18 by then, even though I was a grown man, I was still scared of him. So I just walked away, plastered a fake smile on my face and pretended everything was fine. That was the last straw. I knew I couldn't stay in that house anymore. So as soon as I graduated, I started planning my escape. I applied to colleges and cities as far away as possible, and when I got into a decent university three states over, I didn't even hesitate. I packed my bags and left without looking back. The first few months away from home were weird. It was like I didn't know how to function without the constant anxiety of wondering when Noah would snap next. I kept expecting something bad to happen, like he'd show up at my dorm room one day and drag me back. But he didn't. I was free. Or at least I thought I was. University life was supposed to be my fresh start. I threw myself into my classes, made some friends and even joined a few clubs. For the first time in years I felt like I could actually breathe. But even then there was this lingering feeling that I couldn't shake. It was like no matter how far I ran, I couldn't escape the damage that had been done. I tried to ignore it but the memories kept creeping back. I'd have nightmares about Noah waking up in a cold sweat, my heart racing. Sometimes I'd hear someone yelling down the hall, and for a split second I'd think it was him. It didn't help that my parents were still in contact with him regularly. Every time I talked to them they'd ask how he was doing, never me. It was always, oh Noah's doing so well in his classes or Noah's been working really hard like great for him but what about me? Then came the job hunt. After my second year of university, I decided I needed to get some work experience. I was studying business so I figured getting an internship or even a part-time gig would be a good idea. But that was easier said than done. I applied to tons of places, but either I didn't have enough experience or the positions were already filled. My confidence was shot. 
I kept thinking Noah would have gotten a job by now. My parents weren't exactly helping either. Whenever I called home they'd ask if I had found anything yet and when I said no they'd respond with, well maybe you're just not trying hard enough. It was like they didn't realize how hard I was trying. It felt like no matter what I did I was still falling short of their expectations. Even now, I'm still struggling with this feeling of not being good enough, of always being second best. That's why I decided to move to a different city this summer. I'm hoping that by putting even more distance between me and my past, I can finally start to heal. But I don't know. Some days, it feels like I'm just running away from something that's always going to be there. There's this voice in my head that keeps telling me that maybe I'll never escape Noah's shadow. That no matter where I go or what I do, he'll always be the golden child and I'll always be the one left picking up the pieces. So, picking up where I left off. After escaping the nightmare that was my family and moving to a new city, I finally felt like I could breathe. This place was everything my old town wasn't. Bustling, anonymous, and full of opportunity. The first thing I did was get settled into my new apartment. It was nothing special, just a small one-bedroom place. But to me it felt like freedom. No more hiding from Noah, no more walking on eggshells. I could finally start living my life on my own terms. I'd been studying business in college so when I moved, my goal was to find a job that would let me put all that schooling to use. It took a few months, but eventually, I landed a position at a mid-sized marketing firm called Brightwave. It wasn't glamorous but it was exactly what I needed. A fresh start in my career and a chance to prove myself. On my first day I met a lot of people but three of them stood out from the start. Ethan, Logan, and Mia. Ethan was the kind of guy who had his life together in every way that I didn't. He was sharp, focused, and seemed like the kind of person who was always one step ahead. Logan, on the other hand, was more laid back, a bit of a goofball but brilliant when it came to creative ideas. Mia was the glue that held our group together. She had this infectious energy, always lifting everyone up and she could talk anyone into anything. We clicked almost immediately. At first it was just a casual friendship. We'd grab drinks after work or meet up on weekends to hang out. Nothing too deep. But over time something shifted. I started to realize that these three weren't just co-workers. They were my people. The kind of friends I'd never had before. Unlike Noah or my parents they actually cared about me, wanted to hear what I had to say, supported me without judgment. As we got closer we started coming up with these wild, crazy ideas. I'm talking about stuff that most people would laugh off as impossible, but for some reason Ethan, Logan, and Mia were always down for it. One of the first crazy ideas I suggested was something that even I wasn't sure we'd go through with. There was this abandoned building downtown. An old warehouse that had been empty for years. I was joking around one night after a few too many beers, saying we should break in and throw a secret rave there. But instead of brushing it off, Logan grinned and said, let's do it. And just like that, we were planning the most ridiculous, illegal party you could imagine. The four of us spent weeks figuring out the logistics, how to sneak in without getting caught, how to rig up the lights and sound system without anyone noticing, and how to invite just enough people that it wouldn't get too out of hand. It felt insane like we were pulling off some sort of heist, but it was exhilarating. The night of the rave was unforgettable. Hundreds of people showed up, far more than we'd expected, and for hours the place was packed with music, lights, and chaos. For the first time in my life I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself. It was reckless and stupid sure, but it was also the most alive I'd ever felt. Of course it couldn't last. The cops showed up eventually and we barely escaped before they busted the place. We spent the next few days laying low, half expecting to get arrested, but nothing ever came of it. In the end, the whole thing became this legendary story that everyone in the city seemed to know about, and for a while, we were the center of attention. After that, we started pushing the boundaries even more. Ethan, always the calculated one, suggested we invest in cryptocurrency. This was back before it blew up so none of us really knew what we were doing but we figured we'd give it a shot. I threw in a small amount of money and so did the others. It was one of those why not moments, where none of us really expected it to go anywhere. Except, somehow, it did. A few months later, the value skyrocketed, and we found ourselves sitting on a pretty decent chunk of change. It wasn't life-changing money, but it was enough to get us thinking. If we could pull that off, what else could we do? That's when I started to get the itch. I'd been at Brightwave for almost two years by that point, and while I was doing well, climbing the ranks, getting promotions, it wasn't enough. I wanted more. I wanted to build something of my own, something that wasn't tied to anyone else's expectations. So I came up with another idea starting my own marketing consultancy. At first it was just a pipe dream. I talked about it with Ethan, Logan, and Mia, and they were all supportive, but I wasn't sure if I was ready to take the leap. I kept thinking about Noah, about how he'd always been the golden child, and I wondered if maybe I was just chasing something that wasn't meant for me. But Mia wasn't having any of that. She looked me dead in the eye one night and said, you've spent your whole life living in someone else's shadow. It's time to step into the light. So I did it. I quit my job at Brightwave and started building my own consultancy from the ground up. Ethan and Logan helped with the financial side of things, Ethan with his investment smarts and Logan with his creative genius. Mia was my sounding board, my biggest supporter and my closest friend. She believed in me in a way that no one else ever had, and it made all the difference. The business took off faster than I could have imagined. Within six months, I had a solid client base and word was spreading that I was the go-to guy for marketing strategy in the city. It was surreal. I'd spent so long doubting myself, thinking that I'd never be more than Noah's shadow, and suddenly, I was standing on my own two feet. But with success came complications. The first big shock came when Logan, who had always been a bit of a wild card, 
decided he wanted to take things even further. He pitched this insane idea of buying out a failing nightclub and turning it into the hottest spot in the city. It was risky, borderline crazy, but Logan was convinced it would work. He had a knack for spotting trends before they hit, and he swore up and down that this was going to be the next big thing. Against my better judgment, I went in on it with him. We pooled our money, got a loan, and bought the place. For a while, it looked like it was going to be a disaster. The club had a terrible reputation and no one wanted to be seen there. But Logan worked his magic. He rebranded it, hired the best DJs and somehow managed to turn the place around. Within a few months it was packed every weekend and we were raking in the cash. It should have been a victory but instead, it became the beginning of the end. As the club grew more successful, Logan started to change. He became obsessed with it, pouring all his time and energy into the business and pushing the rest of us away. It wasn't long before tensions started to rise. Ethan, always the voice of reason, tried to talk him down but Logan wasn't hearing it. He'd gotten a taste of the high life and he didn't want to let go. The real turning point came when Logan decided to throw a massive over-the-top New Year's Eve party at the club. He spared no expense, celebrity appearances, pyrotechnics, the whole nine yards. Ethan and I both thought it was a bad idea. The cost alone was astronomical, and we didn't have the resources to pull it off without risking everything we'd built. But Logan didn't listen. He went ahead with the party anyway and it was a disaster. The place got overcrowded, fights broke out, and by the end of the night, the police had shut it down. We were slapped with fines and the negative press was brutal. In the span of a few hours, we went from being the hottest club in the city to the biggest scandal. Logan spiraled after that. He blamed everyone but himself for what had happened, and it wasn't long before we had a full-blown falling out. Ethan tried to mediate but it was too late. Logan quit the business, leaving us to pick up the pieces. I'll admit it hit me hard. I thought Logan was my friend that we were in this together. But in the end he cared more about the success than the friendship. It made me realize that no matter how far I ran from my past, there would always be people like Noah in my life. People who would take and take until there was nothing left. But unlike before, this time I wasn't going to let it break me. I had Mia and Ethan by my side and I had my business, which was still standing strong despite the mess Logan had left behind. I'd come too far to let one setback ruin everything. So now here I am, sitting in my office, looking out at the city that's become my home. I'm still thinking about starting my own agency, something bigger than just a consultancy, maybe a full-fledged marketing firm, something that could really make a mark. It's terrifying but it's also exciting. For the first time in my life, I'm not just surviving, I'm thriving. But there's always that little voice in the back of my mind, the one that sounds a lot like Noah, telling me that it's all going to come crashing down eventually. That no matter how hard I try, I'll never be good enough. I'm still trying to figure out how to shut that voice up for good. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me through this long post. Writing it all out has been cathartic, I guess. If anyone has advice on how to deal with friends who turn on you, or how to stop doubting yourself after a lifetime of being told you're not enough, I'm all ears. After everything that went down with Logan and the nightclub fiasco, I didn't think I'd ever be able to work with him again. The fallout had been brutal, both emotionally and financially, and the rift between us seemed too deep to mend. But life has a funny way of surprising you. It had been a few months since the club debacle, and I was busy running my consultancy which was still doing well despite the setback. Ethan and Mia had stuck by my side through it all, and we were starting to think about new ways to grow the business. I'd thrown myself into work, trying to distract myself from the lingering feeling that something was missing. Then, out of nowhere Logan reached out. I remember staring at his name on my phone, debating whether or not to answer. Part of me wanted to tell him to go to hell for bailing on us when things got tough. But another part of me, maybe the part that remembered all the good times we'd had, wanted to hear him out. So I answered. Hey he said, his voice quieter than I remembered. I messed up, gee big time and I know I don't deserve another chance but I want to make things right. I didn't say anything for a long moment, letting his words hang in the air. A part of me wanted to hang up right then and there but something stopped me. Maybe it was the sincerity in his voice, or maybe I just wasn't ready to give up on him completely. Let's meet I said finally. But I'm not making any promises. Logan and I met at a small coffee shop downtown a few days later. When I saw him, it was clear that he hadn't been doing well. He looked rough, tired, stressed and a little lost. Gone was the cocky larger-than-life persona he'd carried when we were running the nightclub. This was a different Logan, one who seemed humbled by his mistakes. We talked for hours that day going over everything that had happened. Logan admitted that he'd let success get to his head, that he'd been chasing something bigger than himself without thinking about the consequences. He apologized not just for leaving us in the lurch, but for how he'd treated all of us, especially me. It wasn't easy to hear but I could tell he was being genuine. By the end of the conversation, something inside me had shifted. I wasn't ready to forgive and forget but I realized that maybe, just maybe, there was still a way for us to work together. I called Ethan and Mia later that night and told them about the meeting. Both of them were skeptical at first, understandably so. They'd seen firsthand how Logan's ambition had nearly destroyed everything we'd built. But after some back and forth, we decided to give him another chance under one condition. This time we would do things differently. Everything would be above board, legal and we'd have a clear plan. Logan agreed without hesitation. We spent the next few weeks brainstorming ideas, trying to figure out what kind of business we could launch that would play to all of our strengths. Logan as always had big ideas. He wanted something that could scale quickly, something that would put us on the map. Ethan was more cautious, reminding us that we needed to focus on sustainability if we wanted to avoid another disaster. Mia, 
Ever the mediator helped us find common ground. Eventually, we landed on the idea of launching a digital marketing agency with a focus on helping small businesses and startups. It was a natural extension of the consultancy I'd already been running, but with Logan's flair for branding and Logan's contacts in the nightlife and entertainment industries, we knew we could take it to the next level. We called the new company Brightline Marketing and got to work right away. This time, we were determined to avoid the mistakes we'd made with the nightclub. Everything was done by the book, permits, contracts, legal structures, the works. We each took on specific roles within the company. Logan handled client acquisition and branding, Ethan managed the financials and operations, Mia led the creative direction, and I oversaw strategy and client relationships. As we were getting the business off the ground, we decided to revisit an old idea. Cryptocurrency. The small investment we'd made months earlier had grown substantially, and we were starting to see real returns. Logan, ever the risk taker, wanted to pour more money into it, convinced that the market was about to explode. At first, I was hesitant. We were just starting to gain traction with Brightline, and I didn't want to risk everything on something as volatile as crypto. But Ethan, who'd been tracking the market closely, agreed with Logan. They both believed we were sitting on a golden opportunity. Mia, always up for an adventure, was fully on board. In the end, I decided to trust them. We pooled our resources and invested a significant chunk of our profits into various cryptocurrencies, focusing on a few lesser-known coins that Logan had researched extensively. It was a gamble, no doubt about it, but one that felt calculated. Meanwhile, Brightline started to take off. Within a few months, we had secured a handful of major clients, including a local tech startup and a national restaurant chain that needed help rebranding after a PR crisis. Word of mouth spread quickly, and before we knew it, we were expanding faster than any of us had anticipated. That's when things got really crazy. About six months after we'd launched the company, the cryptocurrency market exploded. The coin we'd invested in, one of those obscure altcoins that no one had paid attention to, skyrocketed in value, jumping nearly 78 times what we'd originally paid. Overnight, we went from being moderately successful business owners to full-blown millionaires. I'll never forget the moment I checked my crypto wallet and saw the numbers. I was sitting at my desk, going over some client reports when the notification popped up on my phone. At first, I thought it was a glitch. There was no way the value could have jumped that much in such a short time. But when I refreshed the app and saw the same number staring back at me, my heart nearly stopped. I immediately called Ethan, who picked up on the first ring. Dude, he said, sounding just as stunned as I was. Are you seeing this? Yeah, I replied, still trying to wrap my head around it. We're, we're rich. The next few hours were a blur. We called Mia and Logan, and the four of us spent the rest of the day in disbelief, watching as the value of our investment continued to climb. By the end of the week, we'd officially become millionaires. It was surreal. But the money wasn't the only thing that changed. With our newfound wealth came new opportunities, new pressures, and new challenges. For one, we had to figure out what to do with all that money. Ethan, always the practical one, suggested we reinvest some of it into Brightline and use the rest to diversify our assets, real estate, stocks, and other ventures. Logan, predictably, wanted to go big. He was already talking about opening more businesses, expanding Brightline internationally, and even launching a tech startup. In the end, we struck a balance. We invested a portion of our crypto earnings back into Brightline and used the rest to purchase several commercial properties around the city, which we turned into co-working spaces for startups and small businesses. The demand for flexible office space was skyrocketing, and it seemed like the perfect way to grow our portfolio without taking on too much risk. I also bought myself a house, well, more like a mansion. It felt ridiculous, spending $430,000 on a place that was way too big for just me. But after everything I'd been through, I figured I deserved it. The house was in a quiet, upscale neighborhood on the outskirts of the city, with a massive backyard, a pool, and enough space to host the kind of parties I'd only dreamed about growing up. For the first time in my life I felt like I'd made it. I had a thriving business, a close-knit group of friends, and more money than I knew what to do with. But as the months went by, I started to realize that success wasn't as simple as I'd thought. The first shock came when Logan, who had always been the most ambitious of us, started talking about going solo. He'd been working on a side project, some kind of AI-driven marketing platform, and he was convinced it was going to be the next big thing. At first, I didn't think much of it. Logan was always coming up with big ideas and most of them never went anywhere. But this time he was serious. One night, after a long day at the office, he sat me down and told me he was leaving Brightline to focus on his new full-time venture. I'm not abandoning you guys, he said, clearly trying to soften the blow. I just need to follow this path, you know? It's something I have to do. I didn't know what to say. On the one hand, I understood where he was coming from. Logan had always been restless, always looking for the next big thing. But on the other hand, I felt betrayed. We'd built Brightline together. We'd gone through hell and back and now, just when things were really taking off, he was bailing on us again. It wasn't the first time Logan had walked away but this time felt different. This time, it wasn't because of some massive failure or fallout. It was because he was chasing something bigger, something that didn't include me, Ethan, or Mia. We parted on good terms, or at least as good as they could be under the circumstances. Logan went on to launch his AI platform, which, unsurprisingly, became a huge success within a year. I kept running Brightline with Ethan and Mia, and while we continued to grow and expand, there was always a lingering sense that something was missing. Success, I'd learned, was never just about the money or the business. It was about the people you surrounded yourself with, the connections you built along the way. And as I sat in my massive mansion, surrounded by everything I'd ever wanted, 
I couldn't shake the feeling that I was still searching for something more. It had been almost two years since I moved into the mansion I'd bought. Life was good, better than I could have ever imagined. Brightline was thriving, our investments had paid off, and I'd finally built the life I'd always wanted, free from the shadow of my past. My friends Ethan and Mia were still by my side and we were expanding the business faster than we could keep up with. We'd even hired a few new people, including Sarah, a brilliant graphic designer who had a knack for turning even the dullest campaigns into viral sensations, and Aaron, a former lawyer turned business strategist, who helped us navigate the complexities of our rapid growth. But as anyone who's been through life's ups and downs knows, good things don't last forever. The storm hit when I least expected it. It was a Saturday afternoon and I was relaxing by the pool, enjoying the peace and quiet. I had plans to meet Ethan and Mia later that evening to discuss a new client, but for now, I was just soaking in the calm. That's when I heard the doorbell ring. At first, I thought it might be a delivery or a neighbor, but when I opened the door, I was met with a face I hadn't seen in years. No. My heart sank the moment I saw him standing there, looking as smug as ever. He hadn't changed much, still the same imposing figure, his eyes sharp and calculating, but something about him seemed different. Desperate maybe. And then I noticed the woman standing next to him. She was tall, with a noticeable baby bump and a nervous expression on her face. His pregnant wife. I hadn't even known he was married. Gee, Noah said, flashing a grin that didn't reach his eyes. Long time no see. I could barely get the words out. What are you doing here? Can't I visit my little brother? He said, his tone dripping with mockery. He stepped inside without waiting for an invitation, his wife following silently behind him. I didn't trust this for a second, Noah showing up out of the blue. After years of silence, there was no way this was just a friendly visit. He glanced around the mansion, taking in the high ceilings, the polished floors, the expensive furniture. Nice place you've got here, he said, nodding approvingly. Much nicer than the dump I'm living in. I stayed silent, waiting for him to get to the point. I knew him too well to think this was just small talk. Finally, he turned to face me, his expression hardening. Look, I'll cut to the chase. My wife, Emily, he gestured to the woman, who was still standing by the door, looking uncomfortable, is pregnant. We're expecting a baby in a few months, and the place we're living in isn't big enough for a family. We need more space. I felt a pit forming in my stomach. I knew where this was going. We were thinking he continued that this house would be perfect for us. It's big, it's in a nice neighborhood, and let's be honest, you don't need all this space. You're here by yourself, right? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He wanted my house. After everything he'd put me through? After years of torment and neglect? He had the audacity to show up and ask for my home? No, I said firmly, shaking my head. Absolutely not. Noah's smile vanished, replaced by a cold, angry glare. I wasn't asking, G. I'm telling you. We need this house. You're going to give it to us. I stood my ground, my heart racing. I'm not giving you anything, Noah. This is my home. I worked for this and you have no right to come here and demand it. His face twisted with rage and for a moment I saw the old Noah. The one who had terrorized me throughout my childhood. The one who used to beat me senseless whenever he didn't get his way. But this time I wasn't a scared kid anymore. I wasn't going to back down. Noah took a step closer, his voice low and menacing. You owe me G. You've had everything handed to you on a silver platter, while I've struggled my whole life. Don't think for a second that I'm going to let you walk away from this. Emily shifted uncomfortably behind him, looking like she wanted to be anywhere but there. She didn't say a word. I don't owe you anything I said, my voice shaking with anger. I've worked for everything I have, and you? What have you done? You've been a bully and a failure your whole life. I'm not giving you my house. That's when things took a turn. Before I could react, Noah lunged at me pulling something out of his pocket. It took me a second to realize what it was. Brass knuckles? He slammed his fist into my side, the metal digging into my ribs, knocking the wind out of me. I stumbled back, gasping for air but he didn't stop. He swung again this time hitting me square in the jaw. Pain exploded in my head as I hit the floor, blood filling my mouth. I could hear Emily screaming in the background but everything was a blur. Noah kept hitting me, his fists relentless, fueled by years of pent-up anger and resentment. I tried to fight back but he was stronger and the brass knuckles gave him the upper hand. I don't know how long the beating lasted but by the time it was over I was barely conscious. My face was swollen and bruised, my ribs felt like they were broken, and blood was pouring from my mouth and nose. Noah stood over me breathing heavily, his fists still clenched. You should have just given me the house, gee, he spat before turning to leave, dragging his terrified wife with him. I lay there on the floor for what felt like hours, unable to move, the pain consuming me. I didn't even have the strength to call for help. It wasn't until Mia and Ethan showed up, thank God they were supposed to meet me later, that I was finally taken to the hospital. The next few days were a blur of pain and confusion. I had a concussion, several broken ribs and more bruises than I could count. The doctor said I was lucky that nothing worse had happened, that if Noah had kept hitting me, I could have ended up with permanent brain damage or worse. Ethan and Mia were furious when they found out what had happened. They stayed by my side through the whole ordeal, refusing to leave me alone in the hospital. It was Ethan who came up with the idea of pressing charges. We're not letting him get away with this, he said. His jaw clenched. He's going to pay for what he did. At first I wasn't sure. Noah was my brother after all. But as I lay there in that hospital bed, replaying the attack over and over in my head, I realized that I couldn't let this go. Noah had crossed a line and if I didn't stand up to him now, he would never stop. 
so we pressed charges. The court case was long and exhausting. Noah, of course, denied everything, claiming that I had attacked him and that he'd only been defending himself. But the evidence was overwhelming. The hospital records, the photos of my injuries, Emily's reluctant testimony. All of it painted a clear picture of what had really happened. Aaron, the lawyer we'd hired for Brightline, stepped in to help with the legal side of things. He was relentless, picking apart Noah's lies one by one, exposing the truth in front of the judge and jury. Emily eventually broke down on the stand, admitting that she had been too afraid to speak up at first, but that Noah had been the aggressor all along. The trial dragged on for weeks, but in the end, we won. Noah was sentenced to five years in prison for aggravated assault. It wasn't the longest sentence, but it was enough to make sure he wouldn't be able to hurt anyone else for a while. The victory was bittersweet. On the one hand, justice had been served. Noah was finally paying the price for all the years of abuse and violence. But on the other hand, he was still my brother. A part of me couldn't help but feel sad for him, for the life he could have had if he hadn't been consumed by his own anger and bitterness. As for me, the recovery process was slow, both physically and emotionally. The injuries healed with time, but the scars ran deeper than I'd expected. There were days when I couldn't shake the feeling that no matter how far I ran, the ghosts of my past would always find a way to catch up with me. But I wasn't alone. Ethan, Mia, Aaron, and even Sarah who had become one of my closest friends stood by me through it all. They help. Hit that subscribe button now, or you'll be the one asking, wait what did I miss, while everyone else is cracking up.